further delay, I would like to start with the first presentation, which is given by Professor Gilles Montalescu from the Hospital uh, Pitié Salpetrière at pa Paris in France, and he is presenting the results of the Antarctic study, platelet function monitoring an elderly patient stented for an acute coronary syndrome. Please, Professor Montalescu. Thank you very much. After the Arctic study we published in 2012, we I decided to give a new chance to platelet function testing in patients undergoing coronary stenting and uh, looking this time at a high risk population. Um, so we decided to study a, a, a group of patients above the age of 75, all of them presenting with an acute coronary syndrome. Uh, a few words of background. Uh, as you may know, uh, high platelet reactivity is associated with a higher risk of uh, myocardial infarction, but also with a lower risk of major bleeding here in the head. And the whole question, of course, is to determine what is the optimal level of platelet inhibition we should provide to each individual patient to prevent uh, myocardial infarction and major bleeding. Uh, the Arctic study is uh, represented here. We looked at the low risk population of patients with a stable coronary artery disease undergoing coronary stenting. And after the coronary angiogram, when there was an indication for PCI, they were randomized for a strategy of platelet function monitoring. And they were adjusted for the antiplatelet treatment before, during, and after coronary intervention. And this was compared to the standard of care without uh, any form of platelet function testing and without uh, uh, adjustment of antiplatelet therapy. Uh, the outcome is on the right side of this slide, and as you can see, there was no difference uh, um, between the two groups, monitoring versus conventional treatment. Um, some concerns were raised after the Arctic study because it was a low-risk uh, uh, population undergoing scheduled angioplasty, and we had a predominant use of clopidogrel at that time. Um, and we used uh, the old PIU uh, thresholds, the old uh, thresholds for platelet activity uh, measured with the very fine hour test. Uh, so we, we looked at these uh, concerns and decided to give one more chance to platelet function testing, and we called the study uh, Antarctic, looking this time to elderly patients presenting all of them with an acute coronary syndrome. We accepted urgent PCI including primary PCI for S elevation myocardial infarction. And you will see that one third of the patients actually underwent uh, primary PCI. We did not use clopidogrel, but a new P2Y white antagonist, which is prasugrel. And uh, we used, of course, a new uh, PIU threshold. There has been an evolution around these values. Uh, I think the new thresholds are probably better to and more accurate to uh, identify the patients in the target range in the optimal target range. So this is the design. There is a control group, no monitoring, no drug adjustment. All the patients are treated with Prasugrel 5 milligram, which is a labeled dose of Prasugrel for the elderly. And in group two here, the monitoring group, these patients on Prasugrel 5 milligram had to come back to the hospital two weeks later and be uh, monitored for platelet function. If they were in the target range, they were left on Prasugrel 5, but if there was, uh, 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 platelet activity, which was too too high, the dose of particle was increased up to 10 milligrams. It, it, if it was too low, exposing the patients to bleeding, uh, they uh, were downgraded to clopidogrel 70, 75 milligrams. And they had to come back after adjustment two weeks later for a new measurement and eventually to, uh, for a new uh, 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 treatment. Uh, the primary endpoint of the study was a neat clinical benefit combining all the major ischemic and bleeding events. Uh, this is what we found in the monitoring, monitoring group in terms of platelet reactivity. As you can see, uh, only 42% of patients uh, hit the target of platelet inhibition at two weeks. After uh, adjustment of therapy, we got two-thirds of patients uh, hitting the target of platelet inhibition, as uh, shown here. Um, as you can see, of course, in the control arm, where there was no measurement and no adjustment, almost all patients remained on practical 5 milligrams. But in the monitoring group, as you can see, uh, uh, we had only 55% of patients uh, on practical 5 milligram. And uh, most of the patients who uh, had to change therapy actually were downgraded 
uh, to uh, clopidogrel because uh, platelet inhibition was uh, too important. So uh, we had 40% uh, of patients put on clopidogrel 75 milligrams. A few patients, 4%, were upgraded to prasugrel uh, 10 milligrams because there was high platelet reactivity on uh, the initial treatment with prasugrel 5 milligrams. These differences, of course, are significant. Uh, the primary endpoint is a neat clinical benefit, and we found absolutely no benefit of this uh, uh, strategy of platelet function testing and adjustment of therapy on the basis of uh, the measurements performed in the patients. So you may think that uh, 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 behind this neutral effect, you may have, for example, a positive effect on bleeding because we have lots of patients on clopidogrel in the monitoring group, and uh, uh, the ischemic events going in the other direction. Actually, this is not what happened in this study. Uh, ischemic endpoints, just like bleeding endpoints, uh, are the same uh, uh, event rates in both groups in the monitoring group and in the conventional group. So the study was completely neutral uh, on all types of events, ischemic events or bleeding events. So the main uh, conclusions of this study is that uh, we are facing the largest uh, randomized uh, PCI study in the elderly. Uh, and uh, as you know, this is a, a population which is very difficult to study. Uh, we we, we uh, had almost three years of enrollment for this uh, uh, study. Platelet function monitoring to adjust antiplatelet therapy in elderly patients stunted for an acute coronary syndrome does not improve their clinical outcomes. So Antarctic after Arctic confirms failure to improve the prognosis of patients by monitoring platelet function to individualize antiplatelet therapy. And this time we can say that failure is not related to the risk level of the population or to the type of P2Y12 antagonist. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Professor Montalesco. I, th I think if, I, if you put it very uh, much in scientific terms that your study was neutral, yeah, which uh, you would really regard that uh, something lags behind what you expected. This is true from your study hypothesis, but uh, from my perspective as a clinical interventionist, I'm happy that you end up in the way you did. I mean, putting, putting things positively, uh, this study confirms the safety of dual platelet inhibition with prasugrel at the reduced dose of five milligrams in an elderly population, and that there is no need for monitoring platelet function even in this elderly study population, which I think for the practice is a good message. Would you comment on this, please? I, I can uh, comment on this. Uh, I, I think you're probably correct. The safety uh, of Prasugat 5 milligram in this study looks very good, but that was not an endpoint of the study, and we have no uh, comparative arm yeah. to evaluate this, for example, versus uh, clopidogrel. Uh, we, we have an ongoing study to look at this, uh, uh, I, I, I believe, in Italy. Uh, and and uh, yes, uh, uh, your correct platelet function monitoring uh, clearly does not help. It's uh, difficult to, to use. Uh, the patients have to come back twice uh, to be monitored. Uh, it's costly. Uh, it's, it's time consuming. And there is no clinical benefit for the patients. Even if it makes sense to uh, adjust therapy on the basis of what we measure, uh, the, the neat result is that it, it does not work uh, to improve the prognosis of patients. And of course, this is somewhat disappointing. We are in the same situation as for HDL, for example, which is a, a known risk factor, but when you want to try to uh, increase HDL to improve the prognosis of patients, it, it does not work. Here we have platelet reactivity for antiplatelet therapy, and when we want to adjust the treatment on the basis of this marker of risk, we cannot uh, inclined the prognosis of patients, mm -hmm. and, and this is somewhat disappointing. There's a nice quotation from a British scientist, Thomas Huxley, who said that there's nothing more ugly than the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by the facts. <laughs> but <laughs> thank you very much. Are there questions from the audience, please? Hello. Oh, Melissa Walton, Shirley from theheart.org. Um, so. It appears we're measuring the wrong biomarker. Is that correct? I mean, if this doesn't, obviously, there has to be some truth in this. So what do we measure next? What do we jump to now? Uh, this doesn't help. Uh, it, it is an excellent question. W one one uh, speculation would be what we measure is not correct. 
we measure plate light reactivity with one specific test, which is the, the most important test because this is the, the one that is being used everywhere almost. Uh, uh, the, you, you may think the target is not the appropriate target, but I think we have a huge literature saying that this is the appropriate target. Uh, we, we, we may say uh, the magnitude of the effect when you change therapy is not big enough, and we, we don't see the result of the adjustment. All these speculations are possible, but the other hypothesis is that plate light reactivity is not a risk factor that you can modify in order to improve the prognosis of patients, just like other risk factors. I, I mentioned HDL, HDL before, um, and, and that's a, a, a real uh, question. Um, plate light reactivity, as it is measured, may be only a marker of risk that you can modify, but when you modify it, uh, you don't modify it enough, or it has absolutely no impact on clinical outcome. There, there may be even an alternative explanation. I would like to invite you to comment on this. We have seen an amazing advancement in the stent design and uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the stent coatings, and the stents that are used today have a much lower thrombotic risk than the ones that we used 10 or 15 years ago. So may the lower thrombotic risk of the stents used today, also in your study, have influenced the neutral result? I, I don't think so. And, and the reason is that we are looking at a very high risk population. We anticipated an event rate of 19%. We had, at the end of the day, an event rate of 27% in these patients at one year. So we had lots of events. The death rates are, are high. The, 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 the MI rates are high. Uh, and uh, um, if the hypothesis is correct, we should have seen something also on bleeding. And, and we did not observe anything on the side of bleeding. OK. Julian Belling, Medical Facts. Can you um, say something more about the gender differences you saw in this study? About what? The gender differences. Oh, uh, th th there is absolutely no difference between men and women in this study. And actually, when you look at the primary endpoint across subgroups, uh, it's very solid and very consistent all, uh, across all the subgroups that we had pre-specified, including uh, gender. Thank you very much. If there are no further questions, uh, we continue with the second